everyone coming into our final webinar of the year, the academic year that is in the Northern Hemisphere finishing at the end of, in, in July as it is, not the calendar year. We'll be back again in September. So good to see you all. And for, this is an interesting presentation today by Maria Yukovic, who's going to talk about Russian universities in turbulent times. But before we go to Maria, let me pick up the webinar protocols for you. Now, remember that the webinar is being recorded. Um, although there's been some delay in our posting, we're now beginning to catch up with a backlog of webinars that are going onto our YouTube channel now. Um, and this one should be up in a few days time. Um, so uh, during the webinar, we advise you to keep your microphone off because extraneous uh, sound can intervene. Uh, it's, uh, it's important though to turn your microphone on again when you come into the Q&A discussion after Maria's given the main presentation. Uh, now we advise you to use speaker view uh, in the top right hand corner there uh, so you can see who's speaking during the webinar at any particular moment. Now to join the discussion at the end of the main presentation, use the chat, bring your question or your statement for Maria uh, forward into the chat and from that we'll then select you into the discussion as it rolls out. It's a good idea to come forward early because if you come forward for to enter the Q&A in the last five, 10 minutes, we may have a full speaking list and you could miss out altogether. So, so do come in early. It's a good idea to perhaps start thinking about your question towards the end of the presentation around about halfway through the hour. Um, and the first First in, first served is usually how it works. Uh, when you're invited in to the Q&A, and I'll give you a warning in the kind of private message in the chat beforehand, um, please, of course, uh, turn on your mic, uh, turn on your camera if you can, and then tell us who you are and where you are from, and then come out with your, uh, with your um, question or statement. So to Maria, and um, it's a pleasure to introduce her, a valued colleague, um, and I've known Maria for several years and her, through her work as um, a distinguished professor and head of the Center for Institutional Studies at HSC University in Russia. She's now in Israel and uh, she'll tell us more about um, Russia and Russian higher education today. Um, but I should say that her, although her bio on the CG website for this webinar is quite modest, she's a distinguished scholar. She has many papers and books in recent years, she makes a significant contribution to comparative studies, not just national studies, but comparative studies in the world literature. And she's worked a lot with the Center for International Higher Education at Boston College. Maria, the screen is now yours. Thank you very much, Simon, for this great introduction. We can see that, it's Maria. Okay, great. I can. I hope that you can see and or hear me uh, well. So, um, it's my pleasure and particular honor to be here today and present our book uh, on higher education Russia, jointly with uh, Yaroslav Kuzminov in front of such a such a great and diverse audience, and to use this opportunity not only to present our book but to talk a little bit about what happens now in Russian universities and how the war changes basically the life for not only in the society, but in the higher education system. So I'm gonna dig more in one of the aspects of that, that um, in particular internationalization of Russian universities, and I'm gonna use both the history and current state to talk a little bit about what we can expect in the future. So, uh, but I will probably start uh, with a simple question. Why one more book on, high, on Russian higher education? And why we decided to write uh, a book on that uh, some years ago? And then our initial idea to start the book and some initial proposal was born in 2013. And by that time, the answer was simple. It's because many people from different countries and different universities asked us, what should we read? to understand Russian higher education better. And we had no clear answer. We could recommend many papers and many books on different aspects of that. 
mostly in Russian. So at some point we decided why not to write comprehensive bird view of Russian higher education system by ourselves. And what we wanted to do is a book is to go beyond the data and not only to describe how many, how much in terms of money, in terms of number, numbers, but to go beyond the data and to discuss how institutions of higher education system emerge, how they evolve, and how they work through time. So what we basically wanted to do was to unpack the black box of Russian higher education for international audience. So our ambition was to present the comparative state of Russian higher education based on comparative and historical grounds. Unfortunately, today with the work started, it's more about history of the system in the pre-war time, but still we believe it's very important for understanding our future uh, prospects. So uh, writing the book, we faced one more extra challenge to many other challenges, which are constant changes in the system. So the problem for us, since we were slow writers, was that some chapters were written twice or even more times, because once you finish writing, you have new changes in the system and you need to start with scratch. So for example, uh, we write the chapter on academic profession basically four times, because when you speak about salaries, incomes and conditions in academia, you need to reconsider what you're writing uh, every two years probably. So everybody remembers probably the paradox of Zenon and a hill trying to reach toward to us here. And we can say that's probably uh, me and my closer here, but I think that in our case, the picture is probably far too optimistic and the right picture should look probably like this one. So our education system runs much faster than slow writers, but still we are and the book is published. And here, how the content of the books look like. We have nine chapters, and first part of the book focused on the historical background, starting from the first initiative of the Peter the Great, uh, who was a designer and the main uh, driver for the first university to be opened in uh, 1725. Uh, through 19th century and through Bolshevik and late Soviet times. And we consider that not only as a historical contribution, but as a background of better understanding what's going on in the system now. We also devote a considerable amount of our time and patrons on the governance system and on the financial part on how the system works because their uh, financial uh, model defines a lot of incentives for different actors in this game. We also spent some time on relationship between school and university, considering the issues of equity and diversity in the system. And of course, one of the core chapter is a chapter on academic profession, where we discuss academic community, it norms, it values and also conditions and salaries and contracts. Uh, we decided to have a separate chapter on the research at Russian universities. It might look surprising a little bit because research could be considered as a eminent part of university life, but in Russia, the situation is a little bit different. In Russian academic system, uh, for many years, uh, universities and research was separated parts of the system. So in this chapter, we discuss why it happens, why this and when separation took place, and how now university tries to bring research back to their academic life. And of course, one of the chapters there is a chapter on internationalization. Uh, that concludes the book, and that I'm going to talk about in the remaining time. First, a personal note why I made such a choice toward internationalization. Um, I entered HEC University uh, in 1992 
And by that uh, 1996, sorry, and by that time, university was very young. Our initiative started actually by the support of three leading uh, European university, namely London School of Economics, Erasmus University, Rotterdam, and Paris Sorbonne. And most of our faculty were people from those institutions. And our Russian, fa Russian faculty, who later took exams and gave tutorials, etc., were our co students. So we set the same desk, desk, we read the same uh, assignments, and with the same, we're the same students in the same classes. So uh, the university, which is now a big comprehensive university in Russia, was born actually by the huge support of international uh, community. And uh, that's why I feel important to mention it here. And also substantial part of my research career was always supported by international community and international colleagues and international institutions. Uh, I might name many of them, but of course the Center for International Higher Education plays here a distinguished role in my career because most of my international projects are done together with colleagues from that institution. So for me, internationalization is not just a chapter in the book, it's an important part of my academic life. And when we submitted the proposal of the book to Tron Hopkins University Press, the first question was, why don't you have a separate chapter on internationalization? Because initially we put internationalization here and there in different parts of the book. And I said, no, we don't need any separate chapter because internationalization is everywhere. So I'm gonna mention that in each chapter and that's what we did in the beginning, but later working on the book in the final form, we realized that it's a special topic which deserves some special attention. So we put pieces about that in a separate chapter and now it includes our book. So and the main statement we do on internationalization in our, our book is that internationalization of Russian higher education in most of the periods, with rare exceptions, was and still remains the matter of the state, not university themselves, in all important aspects, including ideological aspect, because the state defines the limits and the vector of internationalization. Also in financial aspect, because the, basically government pays most of the bill for that. And also instrumental, because in most cases, it's the government who decides what are the means and instruments to be used by universities to make themselves more international. And internationalization, of course, was with the system uh, since the earlier periods uh, in 18th and 19th century, our key uh, role was related to, to international faculty. Most of the faculty, most of the academic core of imperial universities were international faculty. And German, of course, was main language of instructions. And even books were either in German or they were complete replicas of uh, German books translated into Russian. And even some, if some domestic faculty was hired, they had their big and important international trainings uh, in some distinguished European university before taking the role. And of course, uh, individual uh, international connections fluctuated with the changes in political context, which was rather diverse during the 19th century, but internalization was always there. And in the beginning of the 20th century, our university faculty, which were research active, they identified themselves with research community, which was more often international than national one. So they were basically the part of international networks uh, beyond the border. Of course, everything has changed uh, with the first decade of Bolshevik rule. Uh, 
uh, and after the period of the civil war till mid uh, 1920s, there were short period of uh, flourishing and boosting internationalization. Why was that? That was mostly because Bolshevik considered internationalization in different spheres, including higher, including higher education, as a political matter. And they consider international research context as an important mechanism for eliminating the country's political blockade. Uh, our book has a lot of examples on that. I'll just mention one. In 1925, there was the anniversary of Russian Academy of Science. And initially, it was planned as a small party for academy leaders. But later on, it was decided to use this opportunity for demonstrating how sound and mature research and academic life in the newborn uh, the country is. So there were a lot of people invited, and some people accepted the invitation. For example, George Mena Keynes or Planck. This is Planck was uh, at the conference, and there was a delegation about 100 scientists all over the world from 29 countries. Uh, just Germany, uh, delegation presented 35 people from different German universities. And it was a time of international connections and training, and uh, international organization played an important organizational and financial role in that. I'll just name a few names. Rockefeller Foundation, Carnegie, and Royal Society in the UK were the most important ones. So in the time of great, great terror, the international policy was uh, immediately shut down. It was uh, related to cutting off travel abroad, cutting off different types of uh, research correspondence, and even meeting international colleagues, uh, there were increasing risks. And you can see a lot of parallels here with today's life of Russian universities and Russian faculties, there were risks of possible accusation of spying, anti-Soviet activity or harmful activity. And there were a lot of cases about that. Again, you can read about that in the book, but just um, one case as an illustration to be mentioned here in summer 19, 36, there was a famous case of academician and mathematician Nikolai Luzin, who was accused uh, for publishing his best results, not in Russian journals, but in some journals abroad. He survived. He was never put to jail. He just had to change the job. But since that time, he never published any single paper in international journal. And many experts consider the case of Nikolai losing as a turning point into cutting off this kind of uh, publication patterns. So uh, there was a period uh, of uh, Russian uh, history, uh, probably after the war, till uh, the Stalin death in 1953 when uh, there was almost no, almost zero international contacts between academia, Russian academia and the rest of the world. For example, in 1947, all journals of academy stopped running the abstracts in foreign languages. And at the same year, many journals published in foreign languages were just closed down. And all literature coming from, from abroad started to be monitored and censored. And what's important about that, it, it was not just shutting down the academia, it was a start of the war, which was the war of ideas between uh, right social science and the rest science in the world. Uh, what, is think, what I think it would be important to mention, interesting to mention are international students in Soviet Union, uh, international students been in the Soviet Union starting from early 20s, but uh, the biggest number starting to grow since uh, uh, the end of the war. 
and it was mostly due to political, not financial motives, because all international students were in the country and the expense of the Soviet Union. And while in 1950s, the focus was on Eastern Europe, in 1960, uh, there was a start of political project called the University named after Patrice Mumba, the first uh, Congolese prime minister who was uh, killed by his rivals. And this university was focused on Africa, Asia, and Latin America as uh, regions. And uh, many, many students were uh, taught there, mostly focusing on medical, medical uh, disciplines and also engineering. And in late 1980s, Soviet Union was ranked the third in terms of number of international students. And we have many discussion on that in the, uh, in the book, but just one, one picture from the book, that's a diagram which uh, demonstrates the dynamic of the number of international students in uh, uh, Russia, Russian part of the Soviet Union and also afterwards in uh, Russia. And here you can see that in late 90s exactly, the substantial part uh, of their students came exactly from Russia and Soviet Union. In early post-Soviet period, in 90s, international support uh, for research and higher education of Russia was uh, really, really substantial and important. I would name just a few foundations initiatives. Of course, SORF program should be mentioned here and also McCarthy Foundation and also different European initiatives. Um, and HEC University was uh, supported by one of those uh, European initiatives, Temple, Stasis, and this kind of programs. And those programs provided direct financial support for faculty and students. They also sponsored faculty training, which helped to make curriculum more international and more up to international standards. And of course, important role there played uh, different publishing and translation projects when a lot of books, uh, especially in social sciences, were translated uh, into Russian from different languages. But what's important to stress here is that universities in most cases, they didn't have their own industrialization strategies. So everything came from above and there were no room for their own strategic thinking are about international part of their life. And state policy of international or uh, internationalizing universities in Russia. Uh, it's probably associated with a little bit later period, starting from mid uh, 2010s. And it's related to different facets of university life. First, internationalization of faculty and research staff. Uh, many instruments were used here again by the government. I would just name two the most important uh, initiative. One was uh, the mega grant programs uh, under which many international labs headed by international scholars were created through the country in universities and research institutions. And also academic excellence initiative, which was started in 2013 and lasted till 2020 uh, to support 21 leading universities in Russia to become world-class universities. And there, international faculty was considered as a target indicator, uh, which measures how successful the program is. Speaking on the international students, again, international students uh, were used also as a target indicator for um, measuring how successful the university develops. And also government gave a lot of money uh, through government quotas 
to teach universities, uh, to teach students in the universities. So for most of the time, until very recently, universities, they never competed for students. They competed for government money. And I think that the key uh, different uh, here. And uh, uh, just one just one point here to mention, it's probably more of symbolic sense. In 1992, uh, university named after Patrice Lumumba was renamed into University of People's Friendship of Russia, just to demonstrate that it's not about politics anymore. It's more about uh, inclusion, it's more about diversity, etc. Uh, industrialization was also used as a quality assurance mechanism of uh, research uh, because publications in the international journals, they started to be considered as a target indicators, both in the individual level to measure how research um, how productive research is, and also on the institutional level, on the level of institutional performance. For example, in again, in academic excellence initiatives, and there were different uh, initiatives also supported by the government for increasing the visibility of Russian research production, uh, which of course includes their move of many research journals, many academic journals uh, from Russia into Scopus. And here, just to demonstrate the picture, that the growth dynamic uh, of the number of uh, Russian universities, including in Scopus. In 2010, it was 148 journals, and this number uh, uh, was more than tripled during next 10 years. Okay, uh, in my concluding part, I'd like to take, talk a little bit about what happens now with the universities under the war time. Uh, two main factors work here. First, there is a tremendous shift in state priorities towards their isolation, not just uh, in the higher education system, but in the society in general. And this factor is coupled with a zero autonomy of public universities. And bringing together those two factors uh, provide um, a move uh, of the system toward uh, what might be called now the sovereign science. And this term is uh, now in use uh, by many Russian public officials and higher education officials in the country, which means the science, which is autonomous uh, out of the rest of the world, which uh, keeps its own priorities and its own standing uh, apart from the rest of the world. And of course, that is coupled with the living international, both educational and research space, uh, leaving Bologna, for example, is one of the examples. And of course, this is a process goes uh, from both sides, uh, especially after uh, rectors of most Russian universities signed the letter to support the war. And uh, one more process which is going on now is losing transparency and visibility, both for outside community but also for the system itself. After the country leaving such a uh, service as a PISA, Teams, and other as a service uh, focused on higher education and secondary education, uh, both experts from outside and inside are losing uh, understanding how the system really works. Of course, there is a huge faculty brain drain. We can talk a, a lot about uh, brain drain, and of course, there are a lot of evidence on that. Uh, what's important for me to stress here in this presentation is that this brain drain includes international faculty as well. And as, as I said, many international faculty were brought 
into Russian universities through different uh, government-supported initiatives. So those faculty were not just individuals who produce their own research output, they were connectors between academic society in the country and the home universities, the home academic systems. And now those people are leaving. So a lot of connections are now broken because of that. And of course, there is a huge transformation of communication and publication patterns, uh, especially after many cases against Russian scientists accused for uh, revealing national secrets, uh, et cetera. And again, there is a parallel with the uh, 40s and 30s uh, of 20th century. And since the agents of uh, foreign influence, uh, those status was awarded to many Russian researchers and public uh, intellectuals, they are not allowed to work at public higher education institutions as well. Of course, and we can discuss that if there are questions on that, um, there is different type of uh, consequences for social sciences and for STEM sciences uh, because of the isolation, because uh, mostly social sciences are uh, sciences which really can't exist or are under isolation at all. Uh, and uh, we can talk about that as well. So, uh, and now my final slide would be on whether we see any uh, uh, characteristics of the new system, of the emerging system, which somehow refers to the return of the Soviet model. I would probably mention a few of them. Of course, the history doesn't repeat itself, but we can see some mechanism which work in the same way as they work in the Soviet times. Just name a few. First, there is basically awakening of some dormant institutions which provide an increasing role of planning in the state control in the system. They were never gone during the last 30 years and they are quickly coming back now. Uh, institutions of higher education, they face zero agency. So they are now more or less agents without any agency and without zero, without any autonomy. And there is a really strict control and increasing control over the international communications. And everything is now related to getting permissions and reporting to the ministries and uh, other agencies, including getting permissions, for example, for publishing international journals in many disciplines and reporting to any international contacts, uh, organization, etc. Of course, it doesn't mean complete isolation because there are now new priorities for international connections, but uh, I basically believe in the idea that it's going to be more about political issues than economic issues. And of course, the international students' recruitments, again, are becoming the source of our political power. And symbolically, in March, to, in March of this year, uh, the Ministry of Higher Education, Valery Falkov, he signed the decree returning the name of Patrice Lumumba to People Friendship Universities of Russia. Uh, when there was an announcement of that, it was said that, again, a symbolic action to stress how important it is to support people who die for their own country and for the independence of their own country. Okay, and here to conclude, uh, it's a picture of the first uh, page of our chapter on internationalization in the book. I'll just quote one of the key facts which is presented there. It says that international search connections can have been very important for Russian academic community from its birth and throughout its history. Periods of isolation, in spite of generally accepted ideas about the influence on the Iron Curtain during the Soviet Union, were relatively short-lived. It was very easy uh, and kind of, kind of fun to run these lines two years ago. 
uh, it's much more hard to read them now, but I still, still believe there should be hope that the war will be ended. And after that, we'll be able to build up the system back again, will be again open and transparent for the rest of the world. Uh, I'll stop here. And uh, we managed to get some discounts from John Hopkins University Press for the book for those who is interested. So the information is on the slides. So I'm gonna stop here. And if Simon permits, I can go to questions or I do whatever Simon tells me to do. Thank, thank you, you, Maria. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, that was a very effective presentation and very informative. And uh, and you've got seven questions waiting for you. So um, you've done really well. And I usually have to work quite hard at this stage of the webinar to start the question process, but I'm only going to ask one. Um, I, it's about HSC, and I'm you know I'm thinking of the fact that Yaroslav uh, Yaroslav Kuzminov has co-authored the book, uh, and he was the distinguished rector and founder of uh, of HSC, and of course built a as you as you as as you did also and others build a very effective uh, university in both the international sense and in Russia, uh, so that it became a mainstream and front rank institution from small beginnings. Um, and there are not many new major universities anywhere in the world at any given time. So that's really quite quite an, quite an achievement. Now, internationalization seemed to play quite a role at HSC. Um, and uh, I mean, how important do you think was internationalization to the success of building HSC? And uh, can, can HSC continue to flourish in an era of sovereign science when Although we hope the period of isolation is short-lived, it's very much with us, as you said at the end, in the present. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, Simon. It's really hard to, to, to respond to the question about our HEC university, but still, I believe that the core idea of our HEC was based on their idea of the open science and open research and their unique quality standards in terms of teaching and research uh, uh, which go beyond the border. And initially, HEC was uh, created as a teaching institution. And initially, the motto of HEC University was not about research, but about providing high quality teaching of uh, new economic theory to new country. That was the idea. And after that, we got our research, we got everything. Again, our international colleagues, they first served as the mentors, and they later on, in the later stages, served more as colleagues and supporters. But internationalization was always there. The second part of the question was, was can HEC prosper and flourish without that? Uh, I would answer probably how we define the success. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid so now the metrics of success is totally different from what we had previously. Mm -hmm. And that I think is one of the key problems for many institutions that are in the country, especially leading institutions and including HEC. Uh, I believe the skill HEC does very good but in the new metrics, which we don't consider, most of us here probably wouldn't consider as fair and good. Hmm. Thank you for that clear-minded answer, Maria. Um, we've got so many questions coming through that I'm going to take them in groups. So I'm going to ask you to cope with having two at once. Um, to start off, we'll bring in Alexandra Benham and then Philip Altback, and we'll ask you to answer both if that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. I'm simply doing this so that we, we get as many people as possible in the short time we have left. So Alexandra, are you there, please? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, this is Lee and Alexandra, yes. It's uh, great to hear the talk. Okay, and the question is, uh, what impact did this policy, say during the USSR period, have on the other socialist countries? Uh, DDR, China. Mm -hmm. uh, thank oh, you very much. Wait, for this. Hang yeah. on, we'll, we'll bring in yeah. Philip. Um, oh, okay, Philip. sorry. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get used to this. Philip, can you come in, please? Uh, sure. Um, 
My question is a simple but fundamental one. Uh, what, Maria, do you think is the future of Russian science in the new, the new era that you've been so articulately explaining? Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's basically uh, two sides are of the same coin, probably. First of all, uh, regarding the Ian Alexander question, I had the slide on civilization until the very last moment, but I just dropped it because of the lack of the time. And of course, civilization was a very important part of civilization policy in 50s and 60s. And what Soviet Union does, it had very expansionist policies toward many countries, including countries in Eastern Europe and Asia to install uh, governance systems in those countries, which were very much alike systems in the Soviet Union. And I think that the impact of those policies was different both for Europe and Asia, because in Europe, they, uh, they basically had to destroy uh, existing systems, which were quite mature in many cases, even more mature than Soviet system itself. Uh, while in some other countries, like in China or, for example, Mongolia, in Mongolia, the education system was basically created with the support of Soviet Union by scratch, and it was for many years considered as a positive uh, positive impact. And of course, the, the, the story about China is a bit more controversial one, because in different historical period, uh, our relationship with China was uh, not that easy. And we discuss that uh, in much detail in the book and also provides, provide a lot of uh, references on this turbulent stories uh, of Russian and Chinese uh, relationship. Uh, on the future of Russian science in light of sovereign policy, again, that's a painful question, thanks Phil for, for asking that. Uh, I think that I should probably refuse to discuss future of Russian higher education on the short uh, term period mentioning that as a future. Uh, I can only talk about long-term future, which uh, I hope would not be too long associated with the current period. But speaking about uh, next years to come, uh, I believe that's going to be a lot of harmful impact related to this sovereign policy, especially for social sciences, and uh, mm, I think that there's going to be a lot of ideology around the sound, uh, around this concept, and also I anticipate the huge adverse selection in terms of people involved in that, and that's everything going to be quite harmful for for the science in general. Well, thank you very much for the, the answers to both questions, Maria. And it's now my pleasure to bring in two more. Uh, we've got Agung uh, Nugroho first and followed by Mokadil Amamaslieva. So um, Agung, can you come in, please? Thank you very much for this opportunity, Simon. Finally, I can turn on my camera. So last two weeks ago, we were having this discussion about the internationalization in Southeast Asia. I remember we were talking about uh, what happened in uh, Malaysia and then Indonesia as well, and then in Singapore and, and uh, the Philippines. Uh, I'm from Indonesia, by the way, and I'm very thankful for Maria for your great presentation related to the internationalization in Russia. I was just wondering, uh, if you don't mind, so I learned that the Russian universities have uh, a lot of internationalization strategies, like such as the international faculty, recruitment of international students, and then public the publication of international journals. I was just wondering, is there any one of these strategies related to uh, the development of human capital? Because I believe that uh, 
Uh, human capital is also very important to support the development of internationalization of Russian universities. So is there any, uh, uh, what do you call that, approaches, one of the approaches of your government and your universities that relate to, for, for instance, sending uh, academic members of universities to uh, undergo overseas studies in, for instance, other, other universities in different countries. And then, uh, what about when they return, when they graduate and return? I mean, you also mentioned in one of your presentations related to the brain drain concept. And it's also interesting to what happened in, in almost all parts of the world, including in Indonesia and maybe in Russia. So in order to avoid this from happening, the brain drain concept, like uh, what, what do your governments and universities do to facilitate the potential contributions of the returnees of overseas study programs. Thank you, Maria. Maria, you are, Maria. there's uh, two questions there. There's one about um, human capital and the other one about, about enticing returnees to return. But before you answer that, let's bring in Mokadil and we'll get the second question in the batch. Mokadil. Uh, th thank you, Simon. Uh, thank you, Maria, for a very wonderful presentation. Uh, just, I was wondering, so uh, in the light of the current uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis, we know that internationalization in Russian higher education, especially with the West and the US, uh, slightly, has almost died just after these so many sanctions and visa uh, cancel, uh, cancellations. Uh, do you think uh, so? such environment uh, may um, bring regional, regionalization just if I if I uh, concept in that way, so of higher education with Central Asian or other post-Soviet countries, uh, I I wonder what government is doing, what Russian government is doing to, um, so to um, develop internationalization of higher education with other post-Soviet Central Asian countries, especially in terms of student mobility and academic mobility. Thank you very much. Okay, Maria. Yes, thank you very much for, for your question. First, uh, speaking about uh, different programs to develop uh, human capital, for example, sending people uh, abroad for study and then returning back to the country. I think that uh, in the recent period, uh, last two years, uh, Russian government mostly focused on uh, uh, bringing people into the country, but not on their uh, stage of early career researchers, like for example, what China did, but they mostly focused on senior researchers who were very well installed in our other international universities and were given incentives to return back either completely or on the part-time basis. So this is a mega grant program, which I mentioned in the presentation was exactly focused mostly on people who were initially worked and get education in Russian or Soviet universities, then left their country for uh, other institutions, and now we're able to come back again partially or entirely to help building and restoring uh, research uh, research in Russia. So idea was to bring more senior human capital, not just as individual researchers, but also as a head of labs who can nurture and train our students now in the country. That was a model which was used by many institutions under support uh, of the government. So uh, regarding the politics of uh, Russian government toward uh, different post-Soviet uh, uh, countries, Again, in our post-Soviet period, during the last 30 years, uh, a lot of government quotas for uh, international students were exactly given to those uh, post-Soviet countries, including Kazakhstan, Armenia, um, uh, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, or those regions, and many international students got uh, financial support to study in or to study in Russia. Now uh, I don't see any long-term clear policy toward uh, those regions yet. There are some actions to 
clear as air by government, but I still believe that they're going to be more consistent policy coming out uh, in the next period. And of course, uh, those policy would be very much based on uh, political factors coming in to the picture, not just uh, the issue of uh, uh, of uh, research or teaching motives. And I think it uh, applies for uh, general for uh, industrialization policy and the choice of uh, priority regions for future cooperation, as well in the sense that uh, countries for cooperation is now chosen not on the basis of uh, research grounds, but on the basis of political grounds more. And that's of course would have a negative effect on uh, research in the country because most of these collaborators are not that research active and don't have such a research maturity which is needed for fruitful research cooperation in the future. Hey, thank you, Maria. Um, and uh, we are beginning to approach the end of the webinar, but we've got 10 minutes or so to run. And our next question, two questions will be from David Law and Dinara Gagarina. So, David, are you there, please? Yes, yeah, I am. Thank you, Simon. Um, and thank you, Maria, for an excellent talk. Uh, my question really has some thematic consistency with the previous questions because it's about talent circulation. Um, there's an outflow of talent, obviously, from USSR and from People's Republic of China. But one of the things that seems to me characteristic about China is that they've always welcomed back people who have left the country and seen themselves as uh, wanting to, to, to go back to a homeland. Uh, for the USSR, much of the talent emigration, I think, uh, was never welcomed back, particularly, of course, the Jewish emigration to, to Israel. My question is about the extent to which this has changed uh, in post-Soviet Russia, uh, the extent to which there is talent circulation now with Russians who have had part of their careers outside Russia, wanting to go back to Russia and being welcomed back to Russia. Mm -hmm. Our second uh, question, our second question uh, yeah. is from um, uh, Dinara, Dinara Gagarina. Are you there, please? Yeah, uh, thank you uh, for possibility. Um, firstly, I'm very glad to see all my old colleagues <laughs> uh, in this seminar. Uh, my question was partly answered answered already, but uh, nevertheless, uh, how do you think, is it any possibility to restore restore system and to go back uh, to the beginning of 2022, for example, and how long do you think it will take to restore the how education system in Russia? Um. Uh, thanks for the questions, so they're quite different ones, so I'll start with the first one. So, uh, I think that you mentioned very interesting uh, phenomena, David, in terms of welcoming uh, uh, those people who return back uh, to Russia. So, and exactly last years, uh, since probably mid 210s was a period when many immigrants were very much welcomed back uh, to Russia uh, to help to restore research uh, community and academic community and help with, uh, with building uh, universities. And I think the reasons behind that there were two folds. First, they really provided a human capital and a unique human capital which was crucial for building research capacity. But I also think there was another factor which were, were more about politics because it was a good demonstration that the current regime works good enough for people to come back. And that was important for political demonstrations that uh, good people are basically coming back. So, but first factor was indeed uh, important as well. 
So coming back to the second uh, Dinara question, first of all, I, I should say that I'm so happy to see so many faces from, from former HEC colleagues and great to see you there. And uh, that's the, they now represent different parts of the world from Europe to China and US. That's great that HEC has such a great impact on, on world-class academia. I'm really proud to be a part of this crowd. And, uh, but to answer your question, I would probably quote our former colleague, Evgeny Yasin, who was a research advisor for HEC University for many years and was also the Minister of uh, Economy for many years uh, in, in, in uh, in Russia, he was asked one time how to uh, how to get out of the deep hole, and his answer was to get out of the deep uh, deep hole. First thing you need to do is to stop digging. So I would say that before discussing any any scenarios on how we can restore uh, the bright future of Russian Academy, we need somehow to stop the war and all things that's happened now. And then I think that all of us will be more than happy to discuss how fast we can go further. But first of all, stop digging there. That would be my answer. I noticed those who are on camera were nodding when you said stop digging. So that seemed to be well received, that idea. Uh, let's hope that happens. Um, now, and in the next batch of questions, we've got Konstantin Platonov and Peter Grachev. So, Konstantin, please come in. Thank you very much. I understand. And uh, hello, everyone. I understand we are running out of time. So, I will just pitch my question very precisely. Maria, mostly speaking about internationalization, uh, my sense is that people and researchers around the world are mostly speaking uh, about, you know, outwards looking stuff, bringing in more international students, more international faculty, more international ideas bringing in. My question would relate to the idea of uh, outwards looking, sending students out, sending faculty out. So what do you think, uh, what role does the outgoing mobility uh, play in the internationalization strategies of Russian universities? I think this question might only be addressed to the past, not to the present or to the future probably, but I hope it's, it's clear. Thank you. And our second question is from Peter. Peter Gretchen, please. Mm, yes, thank you. Uh, Maria, first of all, thank you for your wonderful presentation and uh, book uh, and uh, Actually, now we're uh, a lot talking about uh, China, for example. And yes, we understand that uh, European internalization has finished, but at the same time, we can see the internalization of Russian University with Asia region, and it uh, developing very fast and uh, strongly to my mind. How do you feel uh, and uh, what are your thoughts about how it will affect the universities in the country? Thank you. Maria. Um, first of all, about uh, outgoing mobility, I think it's a, it's a great uh, question. And again, we, are, we focus on that uh, in our book, uh, demonstrating that in the most period of uh, the history of Russian higher education, uh, it was more about uh, bringing something into than sending something out of. So in most of the cases, starting from the times of Peter the Great and also in 19th century and 20th century, uh, Russian higher education was normally absorbing uh, ideas uh, and people more than influencing uh, other systems. I don't speak about civilization here. I mostly speak about open market instruments. So, and I believe that we still inherited that idea that internalization is like making us more internationally than making them more international. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's probably would be my comment. Another comment coming here is that 
Uh, I think that Russian universities are still not uh, very much comfortable with the idea of mobility. For most uh, universities, mobility means uh, losing people for better places. And uh, like uh, in the strong university, you normally consider mobility as, as an equilibrium and you have something coming in and going out and to bring something good in, you need something uh, good uh, going out of, of the picture as well. And Russian universities in most cases, and there are many reasons for that, considering like losing people as again, losing something and we're, we're not, not comfortable with this idea. So standing something out, including students or faculty was always, uh, always uh, problematic for, for strategic thinking of uh, Russian universities. That would be probably my third uh, answer. Okay, and uh, uh, on, the, on the China, um, of course, China is considered sensible question. Of course, China is considered one of their probably key priorities and one of their most uh, important regions for uh, cooperation. And China, unlike many other countries, has very good uh, international standing in terms of research. Uh, and there are basically grounds because of that for mutually benefits of our cooperation. But uh, on another side, China also has her, its her clear and sophisticated priorities. And those are two groups of priorities from both sides need to be somehow uh, brought together. And both players are very, of, of a very strategic nature. And we still don't know how it would uh, work out and what would be the purpose of cooperation and what would be the outcome of that cooperation as well. Well, sadly, we have run out of time. It's been so good to see so many questions. And uh, I must apologize to Lara and Yanina because you had good questions. And um, we just, uh, unfortunately, we don't run a 90-minute webinar. We run a 60-minute one. Um, and we always, when a good webinar, run into the same issue of having more and more things we'd like to discuss as we as we reach the end. Um, it was really nice to see so many people from Russia here, and um, and I think Maria, you know, you can be very, um, um, I think, pleased about the way the webinar went because there were great yeah. questions, and your yeah. answers really added a lot to everyone's understanding. Um, it's been a great privileged, I have to say, to uh, to sit where I sit and host the CG webinar in the in the academic year 2022 to 23 um, in our fourth year. And um, we, we had some doubt about whether we'd maintain a, a two webinars a week and we because numbers had dropped off after the pandemic. And we felt that even though our average audience had dropped from 80 or 90 to 40 or 50, it was still worth doing. And, and today's webinar shows us why we all do this. Um, it's a tremendous pleasure to interact in this open way with people from around the world who come into the discussion because they're drawn by the speaker and by the topic. And we'll continue to use this format in 23-24. Our first um, webinar series will, will be on higher education and AI. And we have a succession of six expert webinars on the topic, which will undoubtedly all of us will learn something new from this, uh, these, th from these presentations. And that first webinar will begin on the 5th of September, 2023. Um, so once again, Maria, thank you greatly for all you do, but especially for today's webinar. Thank you very much. And, and do come back again uh, as you bring forward new writing, new papers, new books for the scholarly community around the world who's interested in Russia. A most important country will continue to be a most important country in science and higher education for the foreseeable future, regardless of the, the problems that are, are being undergone now. Um, as Maria said, things change. In the future, it won't always be what it is now. 
and maybe people will stop digging and start um, rising out of that hole again. Um, thank you all for participating and for staying your, to the end of the webinar, well over the time. Once again, Maria, thank you. And to everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank let you me so say much. bye for now.